All right, this video focuses on chapter 27, the tradition and changes in East Asia. So the uh, Chinese dynasty, uh, the Ming or Berlin dynasty comes to power after the Mongol Yuan dynasty is driven out in 1468. It was founded by the Emperor Hong Hu and used traveling, he used traveling officials called Mandarins who are scholar bureaucrats and large numbers of eunuchs to maintain control. Emperor Yongle experiments with sea expeditions. You know, if you remember, you know, if you remember about, the, if you remember the Zhonghe expeditions, he also moves the capital north to Beijing, or in the for, or the forbidden, where he builds the forbidden city. In 1421, to deter Mongol attacks, 1440, which you know came. In 1449, Mongols captured a later emperor. The Great Wall originated before the 4th century BCE, with the Qin Dynasty in the 3rd century BCE connecting and extending it. It was rebuilt under Ming, it was rebuilt under Ming rule from the 15th to 16th centuries. It was an enormous effort with many workers being killed in the process. The wall would actually stretch 1,500 miles and be 45 feet high. So this is a map of, you know, Ming China here and the Great Wall up here. As we can see, it is obviously, you know, built in the north to protect against Mongol invasions. And that's a picture of the uh, Great Wall of China. As we can see, it is a massive structure. Mo in order to eradicate the Mongol past, Ming emperors promote all things Chinese. They provide Confucian-based civil service exams and schools. They also sponsored imperial academics and colleges, academies and colleges devoted to the Chinese past. They abandoned Mongol names and dress. As well, kind of, this is almost kind of like denazification in Europe, or more cleansing and more cleansing in Spain. Uh, well, Ming decline was you know followed very much in the traditional classic made it have had a dynastic cycle of it. The 16th century pirate system almost disrupted trade and taxes in coastal and interior provinces. The navy and the government were unable to respond effectively. Extravagant lifestyle occupied the Ming Emperor's time and attention, with one emperor never be even meeting with his government in 40 plus years. The eunuchs manipulated the entire imperial household to enrich their own power and position. They were hated by the Ma Mandarins. In the mid 17th century, a series of famines struck China, led to peasant revolts, and the, Manchu and the Manchu people invaded from the north. They established a Qing, or Pure Dynasty. And this is a uh, map of the Qing. Of the Qing possessions, as we can see, they started off here in Manchuria, but they gradually expanded from all of Manchuria into Beijing, and eventually conquered all of China and Mongolia. The the Manchus were originally mostly pastoral nomads, north like living north of the Great Wall. Also, they were, however, they, unlike the Mongols, they were somewhat sinocized and settled. They established control of Korea, Mongolia, and then China itself, and go to war with being loyalists going. And, and engage in warfare with being loyalists all the way up to the sixth, all the way up to sixteen eighty. They they had support from many Chinese fed up with the being unit corruption. They forced Manchu styles as a sign of loyalty, you know, the Q or pigtail. They forbid intermarriage between Manchu and Chinese or the study of Manchu language by Chinese. But the Manchus knew and learned Chinese, and unlike the Mongols, they kept Confucianism. Emperor Kangxi was a Confucian scholar, poet, prize renter, and conqueror. He engaged he conquered Taiwan, Tibet, and Central Asia, which uh, is where the which you know held the remnants of the Ming Dynasty, almost kind of like you know Taiwan today, holding the remnants of the Republic of the of the Nationalist Government that fled mainland China at the end of the Chinese Civil War. Grants, his grants of Emperor King Long expands the territory to make vassal states. This was the height of the Qing Dynasty, the largest Chinese state ever. There was great prosperity, but tax clash had canceled for several occasions. However, King Long, as an old man, and his successors began to get distracted. Ming and Qing dynasty Qing emperors ran, ran highly centralized states. Emperors considered qua were considered quasi divine and lived in the privilege lived a privileged life within the walls of the forbidden city. There were, they lived hundreds of concubines and thousands of eunuch servants. The cloaking designs and name characters were forbidden to the rest of the population. The ritual cow towers required was need to be reformed when you wanted to meet with the emperor. It required free kneelings and nine head bows. There was severe severe punishment was enacted for the most per, minor perceived infractions. 
the, the Mandarins were highly trained scholar gentry and ran, ran the government on a day-to-day -day business. They, are, they were uh, graduates from the intense civil service examinations. The curriculum encompassed the Analects, Confucian classics, calligraphy, poetry, essay writing, and history, history of literature. This, this, those civil service examinations provide, uh, you know, were administered to those who were seeking to become district, provincial, and metropolitan, metropolitan bureaucrats. It was quote unquote open to all males, regardless of social class or age. Only 300 were allowed to pass at the highest level. Multiple attempts were common, and students were expected to bring bedding, chamber pots, and chamber pots for free day uninterrupted examinations. You know, writing very long essays. The Qing Dynasty. Uh, in the Qing Dynasty, you had a million degree holders competing for twenty thousand government positions. With the remain those who failed to gain the positions, turned to teaching and tutoring. This ensured that Confucianism would be at the heart of the state. Like the imperial government, the Chinese family was hierarchical and authoritarian. Filial piety was un understood as duty as the as the duty of the child to a parent. Kind of like you know individual to emperor. The eldest son was favored. Subordination of women began at an early age. Males could bring honor and financial opportunity to family to family via this exam system. Girls were a social and financial li liability, and so infanticide was not co uncommon. This tradition continues would continue up into modern China, where you know now you have a very skewed sex ratio towards males. Widows were strongly encouraged not to remarry, and chaste women were honored with and chaste widows were honored with ceremonial ar arches if they commit suicide, almost kind of like the sati ritual in India. The men the men controlled the verse, and they could do so from infidelity to just talking too much. Foot binding also continued with origins in the Song Dynasty. Girls. It was often performed on girls' wealthy families or pretty female commoners as an attempt to make themselves more appealing to potential husbands from wealthy families. Farming was the ideal occupation. Uh, as intense garden style agriculture was necessary to feed the population, they also they also they used night soil, if, which was basically human feces. Colombian exchange had great benefits to China, with maize, sweet potatoes, and peanuts introduced in the 17th century. This offsets population reductions for rebellion and war. In fact, overpopulation became a huge problem. The silver from the New World also greatly stimulated the economy. Workers could be hired at a low cost to work on China's silk, porcelain, tea, and lacquerware. Cheap, how, this cheap labor may have inhibited industrialization, as whereas in Europe you don't have enough cheap labor, so you have to autonomize a lot of your manufacturing line. It's almost like it's almost like slavery inhibiting Roman innovation. When you have, you know, you don't really in you're not incentivized to do anything when you just have to do cheap workers are everywhere. The Chinese in turn import relatively little, mainly spices, animal, animal skins, and wool and textiles. The West paid for Chinese imports with silver bullion from the Americas. After Emperor Yongle's early maritime expeditions, the Ming Dynasty abandons large-scale maritime trade plans. The Chinese are the Chinese discourage large-scale commercial vendors like the like the English East India Company or Dutch East India Company. Chinese diasporic merchant communities fried and spent the government, however. However, Chinese merchants continued to be active Chinese merchants continue to be active continue to be active in Southeast Asia, especially in Manila. Chinese merchants exchanged silk and porcelain for American silver, with extensive dealings with the Dutch East India Company. The Chinese exchanged spices for exotic tropical goods. During the Tang and Song dynasties, China was a world leader in technology. However, it stagnates during the Ming and Qing dynasties. There was enough tribute that they really didn't need merchants. So emperors favored emperors favored political and social stability over technological innovation, which might lead to a destabilizing change. Short term, it was successful in ensuring stability and maintaining the economic wealth of in China. However, in the long term, China fell behind Europeans studying technological innovations. The emperor and his family at the, or like at the, were at the most exalted positions, of course. Behind, below them were the scholar bureaucrats and the gentry, with distinctive clothing marking their ranks. They were also immune from sub-legal proceedings, taxes, and labor service. Below them were the peasants, artisans, workers, and then the merchants. Confucian doctrine gives greater status to peasants because they were closest to the land and performed the most honest labor. Merchant activity was not actively supported because they were viewed at, it was viewed as a parasite. A view as parasitic. 
you also have the lower class of the military and, the, and you know, beggars, slaves, entertainers, and prostitutes. Neo-Confucianism was a version of Confucian thought promoted by Zhu Xi. Confucian morale is basically a syncretism of Confucian morality with Buddhist logic. And emphasized by the piety, self-discipline, and obedience to authority. The story and Roman Catholic Christians had a presence in China. However, it disappeared with the plague and social chaos of the 14th century. The Jesuits returned under Matteo Ricci, who learns Chinese and attempts to convert the Ming Emperor Wan Li. He also brought Western mechanical technology like prisms, harpsichords, and clocks. He argued that Christianity was consistent with Confucianism, with the differences mean merely due to uh, neo-Confucian distortions. Yet there are very few converts in China, as Chinese abs as Christian absolutism and exclusivity was difficult for the Chinese to accept. Franciscans and Dominicans convert convince Pope that the Jesuits co are compromising Christianity with Chinese traditions like ancestor worship, so he demotes them. Emperor, in return, Emperor Kangxi retaliates by banning newly rigid, re newly rigid cre Christian preaching in China. Uh, this, this is just, you know, ignore this. It's just a nice little, um, oh, actually, if you want to know, this is basically just a nice little summary of all the, each, of each dynasty and their, um, and their, uh, technological innovations. Uh, right. So, if you remember from previous mentions about Japan, we learned about Nara, Haya, and Kamakura, and Muromochi. And today, we're gonna, and today we're gonna talk about the Tokugawa Shogunate. At the top was the shogun and uh, slash emperor. Although the shogun really had the power, the emperor was just a figurehead. Below them were the daimyo or the local lords. Below them were the samurai warriors, peasants, artisans, and the merchants, who are also again considered parasitic. However, the merchants would often buy themselves into the gentry class. There was no scholar bureaucrats or manners, but the samurai were pushed that way with the end of the, with the end of constant warfare. Early shoguns ruled Japan. Like, shoguns ruled Japan for the 12th to 16th centuries and laid a foundation for long-term political and social stability. They were large landholders with private armies, with the emperor merely being a figurehead. However, Japan plunged into its constant civil war in the 16th century during the Sengoku or country at war period. You know, uh, like Japan is fine. Like you know. Japan is finally unified under, Tok under Tokugawa Ieyasu, establishes mil a military government. It creates the Bakufu, or Ten Government, which is meant to be a te temporary and highly mobile replacement for the Emperor's rule. In reality, to the Tokugawa dynasty ruled from 1600 to 1867. So this is a uh, map of Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, we only we often think of Japan as like a north south country, but in reality, they view themselves as an east west country. Now, approximately below the shogun were, were the two hundred sixty daimyo, or or were the daimyo, or approximately or approximately two hundred sixty powerful territorial lords. They are their own independent militaries, judiciary, schools, and foreign relations and foreign relations, etc. The shogun eventually won, won the king aristocrat peasant war of the daimyo, bringing them under their control. From the cap from the capital Edo, the shogun requires alternate in attendance. The daimyo forced to spend every other year at court. Reminds you of King Louis XIV and, Ver and the nobles at Versailles, doesn't it? He also uh, in he also he, the the shogun will also use control marriages and the socializing of daimyo families in order to maintain control. Beginning in the 1630s, the, the shoguns restrict foreign relations. They forbid Japanese to travel abroad and, and import foreign books, and the Europeans were expelled from the land. This policy was strictly maintained for 200 years. However, throughout this period, Japan still maintained a strong commercial relationship with China, Korea, Taiwan, and the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, and there was a little bit of Dutch influence, you know, in Japan. The end of the civil conflict contributes, contributes to po prosperity, with new crop strains and irrigation systems improving agricultural production, probably thanks to the Colombian exchange. Japan moves towards a market production rather than substance farming, yet the population growth is moderate, as the ja Japanese engage in contraception, late marriage, abortion, and fantasy to control their po population. The fantasy was also known as thinning out the rice shoots. The Japanese families, Japanese families, were the limited family size due to the shortage of land because really, like what, like less than only like, what, 
only a very small portion of Japan's land is actually arable, is actually farmable. So we see this uh, rather modest population growth in Japan in 1600, standing at merely 22, 22.5 million, increasing to just a, under 30 million 100 years later, and then increasing to oh, just a little over 30 million in 1850. So not really that much change. The end of civil services create a, creates, a ma, creates massive unemployment for the daimyo and the samurai lords. They are encouraged to join the bureaucracy and engage in scholarly endeavors. Well, however, many declined to genteel poverty. The urban well, urban wealthy classes developed trade activity with you know, with you know rice dealers, pod brokers, and sake merchants, soon controlling more wealth than the, than the traditional elites. This, are, this is a direct contradiction to con traditional Confucian order. Neo-Confucianism was the official ideology of the Tokugawa era. Former era education began with Ch the Chinese language and its literature and the ideas of filial piety and loyalty to superiors. However, native learning or vernacular became stronger in the 18th century as a nativist backlash, emphasizing folk traditions and Shinto. This did help. This helped contribute to the idea. This helped contribute to the. Or this was in part due to the xenophobia in Japan, which still persists very much to this day, and glorified the purity of Japanese society before it was affected by Chinese and other foreign influences. There was a, like there was a new middle class in culture or the floating worlds or yukio. The urban culture is expressed in entertainment, pleasure, and the pleasure industries like brothels, public baths, and tea houses. And Mark is a stark contrast to the Bushido ethic of stoicism. An example of this was Ira Saikaku of the life of a man who lived for love. There's also it, there's also a, sur a surge in kabuki theater with the men playing women's roles and bodraku or puppet theater. Jesuit Franks in you know. If, with Christianity in Japan, Jes Je the Jesuit Francis Xavier lands in Japan in 1549. Is in Japan in 1549. He has a remarkable success, success among the daimyo. The daimyo were hoping to establish trade relations with the Europeans. However, there was a government backlash, just like we saw in China. There was a fear for an intrusion, and a Confucius and Buddhists resent Christian absolutism. Anti-Christian campaign was way. An anti-Christian campaign was waged in the 15, from 1587 to 1639, restricting Christianity and executing staunch Christians, sometimes like crucifixion. So this is a um, picture depicting a um, a Catholic priest, I'm assuming, being about to be executed by the Japanese. So yeah, not a very fun time. The Dutch learning offered the Japanese a glimpse of the world beyond East Asia, despite the fact that, like you know, Japan heavily restricted foreign interactions with foreigners. The Japanese, the Dutch introduced the representational drawing and linear perspective, astronomy and calendars, anatomy and medicine, and the Dutch language. The Dutch, the Dutch presence in Nagasaki was a principal route for the Japanese to understand the world. Before there was a ban, before, uh, before the before um, the, the ban on foreign books was lifted in 1720, the Japanese scholars uh, studied Dutch to approach European science, medicine, and art. However, however, there was also there was some there was there was, how there was severe paranoia with the idea that Deus destroy, which expressed Christian which, which claimed that Christian mission which claimed that Christian missionaries planned to subvert Buddhism and destroy the traditional Japanese culture. Almost think the similar analogy would be a case of Jews in Russia, where, where a where a fever a, where a feverish paranoia. Um, a feverish paranoia uh, spread rapidly among Russians, claiming that the Jews were about were to destroy were were um, planning to destroy Russian culture. This would, unfortunately, in Russia, provoke a series of pogroms. So basically, a little summary from modern Japan was in a, that basically the 15s were filled with war. Of war, it was united 1600 by the Tokugawa shogunate. They controlled their Earthscot's borders, cultures, and birth rate. They were open to learning from Europeans as they had pre previously been open to learning from the Chinese, despite that xenophobia. And they, however, they still maintained their sense of the Japanese as its chosen people. This part, this quite, this pretty, this partially explains why, like when the Europeans, when Japan and China were finally opened up to the world, why Japan industrialized and modernized so quickly, whereas China failed, hilarious, failed spectacularly to do so. 
think of it as the UK of Asia, with the geography being destiny, you know, being 100 miles from the mainland. And that is all. Thank you.